Amen. You can be seated. Go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. And as you turn there, I want to talk about a phenomenon that happens in my home often. Hopefully, you've noticed this in your home. My wife will ask me to go into the kitchen to get the scissors. And I will go into the kitchen to get the scissors. And I will not be able to find the scissors. I look where we keep them. I look in the places I put them because I forget where we keep them. I move things. I look under things. I check everywhere. The scissors do not exist. They are gone from this dimension. And I go into the living room and I confess my failure with hanged head and great shame. My wife, in gracious, patient love, gets up. She isn't even in the kitchen and she sees the scissors and lovingly points out that they're right there on the counter in plain view. She is gracious and patient to me. As flabbergasted as I often am when I can't find something that obvious, I was even more taken aback the Sunday afternoon that I preached through Acts 1. Because as I sat at home and thought about what we had gone over and what the Word of God said, I realized I had pretty much completely skipped over the ascension of our Savior, which is not great. The ascension is really important. We know this because the Bible talks about it a lot. A few examples. Isaiah spoke of the ascension. He said, Behold, my servant, the Messiah, will act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, ascended, and he shall be exalted. Jesus spoke of the ascension. He said in John 3, 13, that no one has ascended into heaven except who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Thus, Jesus' ascension proves he is the Son of Man from heaven. In the first sermon of Acts, Peter proclaimed the primary purpose of the apostles was to be witnesses of the work of Christ, especially the ascension. He said, this Jesus God raised up, ascended, and we are all witnesses. That is how he was exalted at the right hand of God. The early church understood the importance of the ascension. That's why it's part of the apostles' creed which says he was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the grave. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Despite all of that, like the scissors, I completely missed the ascension. But the wonderful thing about preaching in the same place for a long time to the same people is that God is gracious to give me an opportunity to go back And again, look at the ascension. That's where we'll be today. Because in the ascension, we find many wonderful blessings that if we are not mindful, our life is certainly lesser. So that mind, would you join me in prayer to the ascended Lord that he would guide our thoughts and our worship this morning. Jesus, we are thankful that you are ascended. We'll see in this passage so many blessings that brings us But certainly it means you are in heaven and you hear us. You hear our prayers this morning and you are powerful enough to answer our prayers. So we ask that as we study your ascension, we would see the impact, we would rejoice in the truth and we would open our hearts to those blessings. We would reject the things of this world and long for the gift, the many gifts you have given us. Thank you for coming and dying and rising, but thank you also for ascending. Let us always remember the importance of this truth. And God, grow this preacher to be more mindful of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we said, go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 to 11 to get our context. This is the word of the Lord. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, ascended, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but now you are, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Then we get to the ascension itself in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you up into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. God bless the preaching of his word. You believe I missed that the first time? Like, it's so exciting. I'm really, I'm excited to talk about this today because there are so many blessings in the ascension. The first we see is that we have peace in the ascension. Uh, Firstly, peace from war. The disciples ask the question in verse 6. It makes perfect sense in their culture. They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Which we understand how they were brought up. This makes sense. They had been told from the time they were little that one day the Messiah would come and would lead them in rebellion and victory and war against Rome. And Israel would be free. And the Messiah would take the throne of David. They were longing for that. And it's important to notice that's not a wrong longing. Jesus doesn't correct them and say, you shouldn't want an earthly kingdom. He just says, it is not time for the earthly kingdom. This is just like the disciples before Jesus' resurrection. They were consistently distracted from the kingdom of God because they longed for the kingdom of Israel to be restored. They were focused on the earthly rather than the heavenly. This distraction is clear if we look at the details of their question. They ask if he will at this time restore the kingdom. They're not interested in waiting. They want it now. They ask if he will restore the kingdom. They don't want something new or something better. They want what they had. And finally, they want it restored to Israel and just Israel. Now, we've gone through Acts 1 through 12. We've seen how the Spirit has worked in their hearts to soften them and to point them back, uh, to open their hearts to the Gentiles, but we haven't done that part yet. We're going backwards. They're still hard-hearted. They're still very racially motivated just for the Jews. But the good news of the ascension is that the apostles don't need to worry about going to war with Rome or going to war with anyone because Jesus has ascended. He has ascended. There's no need for them to fight an earthly battle. Jesus is already on the throne of heaven. We don't need to worry that like Rome may beat him and he doesn't get his kingdom. He is ascended. And so Jesus lovingly and graciously challenges their thinking. But not just on the the misplaced longing, he challenges their concern about bringing it to pass by showing them that they're not just freed from war, they're freed from all worry. Look at verse 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Can you guys hear me? Is this working? Are we good? Okay. It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. They don't need to worry about the kingdom at all. Not just not worry about Rome. They don't need to be worried at all. Jesus makes it clear it's not their responsibility. It's outside of their authority. And listen, if it's outside of the apostles' authority, it's outside of our authority. We don't need to worry about it. We can't hurry it up. We can't slow it down. The timing is fixed by the Father. It's not our place to try and know or be concerned. The times or seasons are set by the Father. They are fixed Friends, the the joy is not only can we not bring about the kingdom ourselves, we don't have to worry about going to war to bring it about, we don't even need to worry about it because, again, he's ascended. He's seated on the throne of heaven. Why would we worry about the kingdom when he's already reigning on high? But despite this clear teaching, we tend to respond in two ways when we think about God's kingdom. Two wrong ways. (laughs) First, some of us respond by fighting for an earthly kingdom in this world, like the apostles were tempted to do. We become focused on fighting the culture, restoring the moral majority, 
Or, or even I've heard people talk about taking up arms in some evil and foolish attempt to bring about the kingdom of God on earth through military force. That is not our responsibility. Pray, I'm thankful for that. That's not our responsibility. We're soldiers of Christ, but not like that. Secondly, some of us respond in the opposite way. We become filled with fear and worry about the kingdom. I can't tell you how many articles I've read that said, man, this is the last generation of the church in America. Well, Jesus is still on his throne. <laughs> we don't need to worry. In his ascension, we find peace. We no longer need to fight. We don't need to worry about taking America back. Jesus never lost it. Christ is on his throne. It, America has not slipped from his fingers. We can't be focused on building an earthly kingdom here or we'll be distracted from our hope in the heavenly kingdom to come. But we can find peace from our war, our physical, cultural, emotional. We can find peace from the war and the ascension. And we also no longer need to fear because he has won. He's ascended. If every person in the next generation of America walks away from God and Christian, Christianity becomes illegal, Bibles are burned, we're imprisoned, Jesus is still on his throne. Whatever happens, we don't need to worry. This is a done deal. He has ascended. This is wonderful peace. We find peace from war, from worry, and in that peace we also find power. Look at the beginning of verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He contrasts. Notice the verse starts with but. Instead of knowing, instead of figuring it out, instead of bringing it about, but instead of that, you will receive power and it will be freely received. What power is Jesus talking about? We might be tempted to think he's talking about miracles because miracles are pretty impressive. They require a lot of power, but I don't think that's what we're talking about. Look at um, Acts 4, 29 and 30 on the screen there. The apostles praying in Acts 4, they say, And now, Lord, look upon their hearts and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. That's what they're doing. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed. The apostles never claimed that the power to do miracles was theirs. Now, God did miracles through them, but they never saw it as their power. What was the power that they had? To boldly proclaim the gospel. That is the power Jesus speaks of in Acts chapter 1. The boldness to speak. I believe Jesus is, is speaking of that power. He, he's not saying, listen guys, go back to Jerusalem and wait till the Spirit empowers you to do really cool stuff and miracles and heal. He's saying, go back to Jerusalem and wait until the Spirit gives you the power to boldly proclaim the gospel. And this was a power they could not earn. And it's so important for us to understand that because we all know I can't earn the ability to do miracles. At least I hope we know that. You can't. But we tend to think we can earn the ability to be bold. We think we can earn that. We think if we study enough, if we have enough self-discipline, if we have put in enough effort or wisdom or strength or knowledge or might. But notice verse 4. Jesus tells them to go to Jerusalem to not depart and to wait. He doesn't give them a to-do list. He doesn't say, here's what you got to do to earn it. He says, go and sit, wait, be patient. Why? Because Jesus has ascended. There is nothing left to do. If there was still stuff to do, Jesus would do it. There is nothing left to earn. His work is finished. Their only hope was to freely receive the power of the Holy Spirit. to freely receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And once we freely receive that power, not earn it, once we receive it from on high, it will forever reside in us. Jesus doesn't say, man, I really hope you guys can keep it together for the next 10 days, and then if you do, then I'll send the Spirit. He's not concerned that Peter will get distracted or James and John will get angry or Thomas will doubt. He tells them power will come upon you. Not, it might come upon you. Not, I hope it comes upon you. Not, it, might, it may be, if we're lucky. He says it will. How does he know it will happen? Well, that's easy. He's the one that's going to send the Spirit. He knows he's going to send it, so he knows they're going to receive it. And that Spirit, once sent, can never be lost. The apostles could do nothing to earn it, which tells us they can do nothing to lose it. If you can't earn it, you can't lose it. 
We see this teaching all throughout the Gospel of Luke. Jesus taught in Luke 10.21 that through the Holy Spirit, the Father revealed hidden things to little children through his gracious will. So there's no way we can lose the Spirit because we don't understand enough. If little children can earn, uh, have the Spirit, then so can we. Uh, the Spirit won't leave us because of inward doubt or anxiety. Jesus taught in Luke 11.13 that the Father gives the Spirit to his children in love despite their fear. We can't lose our power and our spirit because of the persecution or outside attack. In Luke 12, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will teach us what to say when we're brought before authorities. We can't lose it for lack of understanding or anxiety or outside attack. We can't lose the spirit. Because of the ascension of Jesus to the Father's side and the, whole, the Holy Spirit is ours, we have to be very careful that we never consider that as something we have earned. Our love to proclaim the gospel is not something we developed through practice. Now, you may have practiced sharing the gospel and pray to the Lord, but that desire is not something you just gumptioned up in yourself. Our endurance is not something we earned through our effort. Our self-control is not something we can be proud of or boast about. These are all a result of the Spirit coming upon us. And this word, when Luke wrote that word, the Spirit will come upon you, He's used that word before in the Christmas narrative in Luke 1 when Mary is told that the Spirit will come upon you. It's the same word. How much credit does Mary get for conceiving the Holy Spirit? None. I mean, she was there. <laughs> We're thankful. But she doesn't get any credit for that. In the same way, we don't get any credit for the good works that we do because the Holy Spirit has come upon us. He has filled us and empowered us. We must never boast of the Spirit's power in our lives, and we must never fear that we could lose that power. Because though we are often foolish and anxious and under attack, Jesus put no limitations, exceptions, or fine print on the Spirit's coming. He promised us power, and he promised power that would remain. We have this power because he has ascended, and he has sent the power to us in the Spirit. He has ascended. There's nothing left to prove. There's nothing left to lose. In his ascension, we find the blessings of peace and power. But what are we to do with this peace and power? Well, in the ascension, we are blessed with purpose. Look at verse 8 again. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Christ shows us that in his ascension, our purpose is to be God's witnesses. To be God's witnesses. I never noticed this before. But there's a really important detail. He doesn't just say, you will be witnesses. He says, you will be my witnesses. Which, well, who else are we going to be witnesses of? But he doesn't say you're witnesses of the message. Primarily, we are witnesses of him, of who he is. And who is he claiming to be? In this passage, he is claiming to be God himself because he's quoting from Isaiah 43. In Isaiah 43, verses 8 to 12, this is what Yahweh says to Israel, all the nations gather together and the people assemble. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord. And besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses. The same words that Jesus spoke. But here they're declared by Yahweh the Lord, and I am God, he says. I feel like Jesus couldn't really be making it any more clear who he is claiming to be. He's quoting a passage where Yahweh says, I am God, there's no God before me, there's no God after me, there's no other God, I'm God. And Jesus is like, that is about me. I am God. He is the I am. He was not formed before or after Yahweh. He is Yahweh. There is no other Savior. Jesus is about to ascend into glory and sit at the Father's right hand as the Savior of the world in unquestioned authority and divinity. He is not a new God. He's not earning divinity. He is God, the same God that always has been. Our purpose in life is to be witnesses of the deity of Christ. Not simply to talk about what he did. We need to do that. We'll talk about that in a moment. We should talk about the gospel. But we can't talk about the gospel if we don't understand who Jesus is. If we don't understand his divinity and his humanity, that both are true, the gospel doesn't matter. 
He must be God. So our witness must focus and start with who Christ is, but also what he's done, we must be gospel witnesses. And this is implied in this section, but it's explicit at the end of Luke, where Luke gives us uh, another account of the ascension. In Luke 24, verses 45 to 47, this is what Luke wrote. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. What are the, these things that we're to be witnesses of? Well, he tells us first that Christ fulfilled the scriptures. Without that authority from the Old Testament, the New Testament doesn't make any sense. Jesus as Messiah doesn't matter unless we needed a Messiah, which the Old Testament told us about. Secondly, that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the descendant of David, the offspring of Adam, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, God with us, God over us. Third, that he suffered and died and rose on the third day. He was the perfect sacrifice who truly took the fullness of God's wrath on the cross raised from the dead to see your new and everlasting life. Clint, I'm going to switch to this thing because this is distracting me. It's cutting out up here. I don't know if that's doing it anywhere else, but I'm going to switch to this. and I'm going to forget and move away, and then all of you just point me back at this. We'll get through it. So Jesus tells us these things. This is what we're witnesses of. We're witnesses that he fulfilled the scriptures, that he's the Christ, that he suffered, died, and rose. And then finally, that we are witnesses that his work brings repentance and forgiveness of sins, and is available to all. We, all of us, you, I, we can repent. We can escape the enslavement of sin. We can find forgiveness, adoption, love, grace, mercy, resurrection. We can put on righteousness, holiness, walk in community with God and his people, all these things, because Christ has ascended. I think often we forget how important this is. Our message is finished. Finished. There is no more to add. There's nothing being written. We don't need to worry about it changing. We need not fear a pope or prophet or preacher will change the message. Jesus has ascended. That's the end. There's nothing else. We don't have to worry about change. His message is set. The gospel is secure. It's unchanging. It's unmovable. It's stable. It is the foundation we can build our lives upon. And friends, that gospel message is available to every one of us here today. His message and his identity is proclaimed to you today as Jesus called us to do. So if you need to repent and be forgiven of your sins, please talk with me or someone else before you leave. We would love to pray with you and to show you how you can be in relationship with Christ. We're called to be witnesses. God's witnesses of Christ's deity, of his gospel, his message. But who are we to tell? Well, we see in Acts 1.8, we're called to be global witnesses. We're to be as witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In these three places, I think we see our scope of witness. First, in Jerusalem, this is the city where the apostles lived, where they worked, where they learned, where they had community. They were told to wait there, begin witnessing to Christ when they were empowered by the Spirit. So where is our Jerusalem? Well, it's not Jerusalem because we don't live there. Our Jerusalem is our home our office, our classroom, where we live and have relationship. We're called to be Christ's witnesses. And as, as a church, corporately, our Jerusalem is Jacksonville. Secondly, they're called to be witnesses in all Judea and Samaria. <coughs> this is the area outside of Jerusalem, but still nearby. They must not be content to just reach their neighbors. They must reach further out as well. So where's our Judea and Samaria? Well, just take your previous answers and expand a little. So our family becomes our extended family. Our office becomes our company. Our classroom becomes our school. And as a church, our Judea and Samaria is all the little towns around us, like uh, Virginia and New Berlin and Murrayville and Winchester and Versailles, all these little places, they are nearby, and many of them do not have a good church, and we can be witnesses there as well. And then third... We are called to be witnesses to the end of the earth. And this one's easy because we have the same end of the earth the apostles did. It's the end of the earth. In each of these areas, close, near, or far, we're called to be witnesses. But here's something I never really noticed until this week. The importance of the word and in this sentence. 
He doesn't say, be a witness in Jerusalem or in Judea and Samaria or to the ends of the earth. It's and. Which means we are not living faithfully to our purpose if we are not working in all three areas. For instance, if we are telling our children about God but we're not sharing the gospel in our community, we're not faithful witnesses. If we're sharing with our neighbor but we're not praying and giving to missions, we're not faithful witnesses. If we're not if we're giving huge sums of money to missions but we're failing to share the message with our own family, we're not faithful witnesses. We can't pick and choose whichever is easy or whichever we're comfortable with or whichever we like. We're called to do all of it. So let us consider the ands of this commission. In what area are we least involved, least purposeful, least intentional? Do we need to develop discipline and habit of pointing our family and our coworkers and our classmates to the character and deity of Christ? Do we need to grow in our boldness and connect with that neighbor next door or at the next lunch table or in the next office and tell them about how Jesus lived, died, rose, and ascended? Do we need to sacrifice something from our budget and give that money to support missions in need? I hope you know the answer to all these questions is, is almost definitely yes. We need to grow in all these areas, but I have found when I try and grow in everything at once, I end up growing in nothing at all. So consider what area we are weakest in, least intentional, least purposeful, and make intentional, practical, applicable, and accountable decisions to change that. Let's be motivated to fulfill the ands of that Great Commission, not just what is easy. This is our purpose. But we must admit, this message can be hard to believe. We're talking about some Jewish guy from 2,000 years ago. But we are thankful because in the ascension we have proof. We find proof. Look at verse 9. <coughs> and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. The ascension provides proof to the message of the gospel because Jesus ascended plainly. Jesus ascended as they were looking on. This is not some dream that Peter had in the middle of the night. It was not a vision that John saw walking in the desert. This happened plainly as they were looking on. I did a word study. The word for looking on, it just means look. It's the normal word for looking at stuff. It's not a vision. It's not fancy. They saw Jesus go. It's not smoke and mirrors. It's not any other trick. It is the plain bodily ascension of Christ. They saw it in front of them. They saw it plainly, and they also saw it publicly. Notice the text says, they saw it. They saw it. This was not something one person saw. The apostles, and probably a lot of others with them, even up to 120 of them who were in that first group of the church, were there on the Mount of Olives in public. They were fully awake. They had full control of their minds. And they saw this publicly. We may not realize how important this is until we consider the foundation of other religions. The Mormon faith is based on a vision that Joseph Smith had privately in the woods and which he told nine different versions of throughout his life. Rarely did they match. The Muslim faith is based on a vision that Muhammad had privately in a cave, and his records do not match either. Our faith is not based on some vision someone had privately by themselves. Our faith is based on the public and plain ascension of our Lord, of whom we have multiple accounts, none of which contradict. Our faith is proved by the ascension in its plain and public nature, but also because Jesus ascended physically. He was lifted up. It's really important. We don't tend to think about this, but it's really important that he was lifted up. It doesn't say his spirit was lifted up or that he hit the eject button on his body and he flew up to heaven. He was lifted up. Luke has already made this very clear. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Jesus presented himself alive, not presented himself as a ghost presented himself as a spirit, presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. One of those proofs in Luke 24, Jesus eats some fish. And you're like, why is there a story about Jesus eating fish? It's because in his resurrection, he had a body that could eat. In other words, he had a regular body. 
It was a resurrected body. It's better than these, but it's still a physical body. And Jesus was lifted up physically at his ascension. One theologian said the dust of earth now sits on the throne of heaven. He was lifted up and he sits in a human body in heaven right now, preparing a place for us in our human bodies to have a place that works for us, that we can be joyful in, that we will rejoice when we have bodies like his. And again, this is wonderful proof of the truth because when we compare it to every other religious leader in all of history, Jesus stands alone. You can go see where Muhammad is buried in Saudi Arabia. You can see where Buddha is buried in China. You can see where Joseph Smith is buried. It's just north of here in Carthage, Illinois. I've been there. But friends, you can't see where Jesus is buried because he rose bodily and ascended bodily and physically from the grave. There was no body left to be buried. Jesus' physical bodily resurrection makes him unlike anyone else in history. And more importantly, Jesus and only Jesus ascended powerfully. Look at verse 9. Jesus was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now we think of clouds as fluffy and maybe wet, but in Old Testament scripture, in the Bible, a cloud is really important. Think about where we've seen the cloud in the Old Testament. In the Exodus, God led his people out with a pillar of cloud. When God gave the law to Israel at Mount Sinai, the mountain was covered in thick cloud. When the temple was completed, God pres God's presence filled the temple, and the people saw a cloud fill the temple. But most importantly, a cloud is central to Daniel's prophecy of the coming of the Son of Man. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Daniel saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. In summary, when we read, a cloud took him out of their sight with our Old Testament goggles on, what we are reading is that Jesus is the Son of Man presented before the Ancient of Days, found worthy and given all dominion and glory and a kingdom without end. We are reading Jesus' coronation as he is glorified and that all peoples, nations, and languages are responsible to serve him. Luke helps us see this point by tripping over himself to repeat himself. In verses 10 and 11, we read the apostles were gazing into heaven. The angels ask why they're looking into heaven. They said Jesus was taken up into heaven, that he will come back the same way they saw him go, into heaven. So friends, where is Jesus? He's in heaven. It's really important that we know that because in heaven he reigns with absolute power. We saw two weeks ago in Psalm 2, Jesus is the king. None can resist his rod of iron. They will fall broken before him. The nations are his heritage. The earth his possession. One theologian described this point in verse. He said that Jesus, here at the ascension, we see him resurrected and glorified, ascended before their eyes. Jesus enter, entered into the heavenly courts on high. The conquering king was welcomed back to heaven, foretold by the prophets in Daniel chapter 7. The angels remained amazed proclaimed their praise as the holy flame ablaze approached the ancient of days. Imagine the ovation the hosts of heaven gave to him, acclamation louder than a thousand packed stadiums. That's what we're reading about here. The ascension is not some afterthought of the gospel. It's the enthronement of our king. It's his coronation celebration. It's his presentation before the Father and his sitting at his right hand in glory. So friends, if you doubt the gospel story, if you're unsure if all this is true, perhaps someone has been telling you about their faith and it seems more sensible, remember Jesus alone has proven his claim by ascending. Only Jesus plainly, publicly, physically, powerfully proved who he is and how we can be found safe in him. Only he has ascended. That should make us bold to share and confident in the truth. 
We must be thankful for the blessing of proof in the ascension, all the things we have now, but what about the future? Well, in the ascension, we have the blessing of his promise, of our promises. Look at verses 10 and 11. There we read, while they were gazing into heaven as he went, (coughs) behold, two men stood by them in white robes, the way Luke refers to angels, and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So again, where's Jesus? He's in heaven. Before we get to the promise, we need to consider why the angels gave this promise at this time. The text says the apostles were gazing into heaven, which implies a long time. Why did they stand there gazing? We don't have a definite answer, but I think it's because they were afraid. We, we didn't get to spend three years every day with Jesus. But imagine, imagine your spouse just disappe- like disappearing, fearing that you won't see your loved one again. Fear, oh, Jesus is gone. What, what are the Romans going to do? What are the Pharisees going to do? What are we going to do? Well, that's why we have these promises. Though Jesus is not here, he is in heaven. We are not left alone. Look at these promises. The first one, They promise that Jesus will remain unchanged. The text says this Jesus, which at first I thought was kind of unnecessary. It's like, well, we know which Jesus you're talking about. The one that just went up into heaven. I mean, what's the question? But I think if we know people, we know why this is important because people change. And not always for the best. Jesus has ascended to the throne of God. He won't change. He won't become bitter and selfish and graceless. He won't give up on us and get tired of us. He'll remain the same loving Savior they've always known, that we've always known. He won't become a harsh taskmaster, expecting us to live perfectly. He's going to remain the same gracious Lord who asks us to believe. He won't, be, he won't just give up on calling us to holiness and like, look, they can't get it, never mind, just do what you want. He's not going to do that. He'll remain the same wise God who gave them the commandment to love one another. This Jesus, the one we read about in the Gospels, this Jesus will come back. We don't have to worry that he'll wake up on the wrong side of the bed or that God will give him some new command that he's got to do something different. We don't have to worry about change. This Jesus will return. If there was ever a time he was going to change, it would be on his way into heaven. Right? I mean, that seems like a good time. He didn't change then. This Jesus will come back. We have no fear. This gives us such hope. Listen, friends, Jesus will never change, which means what he asks of us will never change. How he feels about us will never change. How he loves us will never change. The same Jesus we read in the Gospels who is gentle and lowly, the same one will come back. He will remain unchanged. We've already mentioned this, but that's the second promise. He will come back. He will return to us. They promise Jesus will come back. Think about all the things in the way of Jesus coming the first time. Well, one, he's got to be born without a father. And then Mary has to travel a whole long way because of some census. Then she's put in a stable. Then even once Jesus is born, Herod tries to kill every baby he can find just in hopes of getting Jesus. Look, friends, if, if the world and Satan can't stop baby Jesus, they're not going to stop the ascended Jesus. Listen to the way John describes the ascended Jesus in Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Not a baby. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, many crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. No one is stopping Jesus. He will return. They couldn't stop his first coming. They will not stop his second coming. And though the world seems to celebrate a victory party every day that they have defeated God, as we saw in Psalm 2, they have their 
vain plotting and mocking and jesting. They think they've cast off God's sovereign control. Jesus is coming back. And when he does, nothing will stand in his way. Nothing can stop him. And what will our beloved Savior do when he comes back? Well, he'll rescue us. He'll rescue us. For the angels say Jesus will come in the same way as they saw him go. What does that have to do with our rescue? Well, certainly, if he's coming back the same way he left, he's coming with the clouds, he's coming with divinity. We see that throughout the New Testament. <clears throat> but I think they're also speaking of another very important prophecy from the Old Testament. They say he'll come back in the same way they saw him go. And in verse 12 of this chapter, we read that this all occurred on the Mount of Olives or the Mount called Olivet. By saying Jesus will come the same way as they saw him go, the angels are promising that he will return on a cloud, showing his divinity, but also that he'll return to the Mount of Olives. Well, why does that matter? Well, it matters a lot if we know Zechariah 14, which says this, the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. On that day, living waters shall flow out of Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Zechariah foresaw a day when Yahweh would come down himself to fight against the enemies of Israel and redeem them and rescue them from their oppressors. And now the angels are telling them, hey, Jesus is going to come back to the same mountain. And they would have known this prophecy from Zechariah. And they would have known what the angels were promising. The angels were promising victory, deliverance, a stream of the water of life that will never fail. It will continue in summer and winter. It doesn't dry up in drought. It doesn't flood when the snow melts it continues always as he rules and reigns as king and lord of the earth. Friends, Jesus has ascended. Nothing can stop his rescue mission. He will come down in a cloud to the Mount of Olives. He'll defeat his enemies. He'll bring life-giving water to his people. He will rescue us. And that's ultimately why I wanted to revisit the ascension, because though it's an important theological point that we should know, and it's an important part of the gospel. It gives us confidence to defend our faith. Much more importantly, the ascension is the guarantee and bedrock of the promise that Jesus will return. So have you been discouraged or depressed lately? Have you felt hopeless or anxious? Have you felt lonely or abandoned? Friends, Jesus is ascended. And he will bring the water of life when he comes. In him we have peace and power and purpose and proof, and most importantly, we have the promise of his return. And so we end our time in the word today with the final verses of scripture, which speak of this same theme. In Revelation 21 or 22, John writes, the spirit and the bride say, come, let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty, come, let the one who desires to take the water of life that will flow from the Mount of Olives without price. He who testifies to these things, Jesus, says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the grace of our Lord Jesus, the ascended one, be with you all. Amen. May that be all our hope and prayer, that he who ascended would return to us soon to rescue us and give us life. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are thankful that your promise is sure, that it is unchanging, and it is proven by the ascension. God, we've seen the blessings of this verse. I pray that we would live in light of them. Give us peace from our fears. Help us trust in the power you have given us freely to fulfill your purpose and be your witnesses. Let us speak often of the ascension because it proves our message true and let us trust always in the promise that you are coming back in the same way you left, riding on the clouds to give us life. We thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to live in light of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Church, would you stand as we sing our final song? And at the conclusion of the song, we'll take the Lord's Supper.